World Summit of Information Society. I think it's very important right now to create or to move, create more people, Jews participating in IGF, which I think it's lack of participation. I don't know if you ha have thought on that. Well, in fact, this project has um, started in a more broad uh, group. It was a youth workshop that was put together by Diplo last year. It was really the start of this whole idea. And there were people in the workshop that yeah, with Caucus, but um, we haven't been really in touch with them. But as I said, the, the group is open to anybody who could join. and. Since we have evaluated that it was a good and valuable experience, we want to extend our connections and surely next year we will get in touch not only with them but with other organizations and we'll like, try to focus more on youth because this year we were, we were focused on how to put together the idea. It was a real intense work on um, what would be the best model to testing the platforms. It was really dedicated to, to conceiving an idea of remote participation that could work in the IGF. And the next year, we hope that we put more effort to expand our network and to engage more people to the project. Let's take one more question and then we'll uh, move to the second part of the panel. There was one question in front of Katiz. Oh, in the back. First of all, how large was the staff, maybe I missed it, how large was the staff supporting this youth project? And um, are some of the materials like the games and projects and uh, educational materials prepared available for other organizations to use? We are also drawing on uh, the staff of other projects in the ministry. So if we're talking, for instance, about the Arabization of some mat material, we get help from the e-content initiative in the ministry. If we're talking about uh, the creation of curriculum, we get help from another entity. So what we do is to leverage all the resources we have. The, the actual full-time staff is six persons only. F uh, concerning the material, definitely it's available. Uh, of course, whatever material we have uh, property rights, it's on. Uh, when we arabize, we make it available to whoever requested from us. We have already provided this to uh, some NGOs in Sudan and in Yemen, according to the request. So we're uh, open for that, definitely. Well, thank you both once again. And I'll invite now our second group of panelists to uh, come up. And while they uh, settle in, uh, let me tell you who they are. First, we'll hear from um, Professor Wolfgang Kleinwachter, who is um, a professor at the University of Aarhus. He's also the co-founder of GigaNet and uh, well known to many of you, I'm sure. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dr. Christina Iriond. She will speak about privacy. Um, and uh, finally, we'll hear from Agnieszka Verzhashian. She will talk about child safety online. Um, and my apologies, last but not least, we'll hear from um, Ravi Parasram Punia, and he will talk about a, pro a youth led project called Life Units. You can check it out at lifeunits.com. I feel very honored to become invited to this workshop. As a grandfather, I feel always happy to be in a workshop on the youth and internet governance. Uh, because the young people are the innovators of today and the leaders of tomorrow. And in so far investment in young people, that's really investment into the future. And when I said they are the innovators of today and the leaders of tomorrow, then um, I mean that very literally, because if you look into the short history of Internet, all the big innovations which came out of the last 10 years which had led to big institutions, eBay, Skype, Google, Amazon, um, Facebook. All this was created by young people in their 20s. And in so far, you know, um, this is really um, the most creative time in your life, 
your 20s. So, and you have to make use of this, this phase of your life. And if you go back through the history of um, uh, Nobel Prizes, and you ask, you know, when they made the Nobel Prize uh, winners, when they made their inventions, which later then uh, justified to hand over to them the prize. Very often they made this in invention in their 20s. So that's why I think it's important really to... internet governance elsewhere, you go to university and say, you know, I want to study internet governance. So they will send you to various faculties, sociology, philosophy, law, economics, informatics. So the question was, it was an undefined issue. Some people understood that internet governance um, in a narrow sense. Uh, because the terminology appeared from the uh, emergence of the domain name system and IP addresses. So uh, the management of these critical internet resources was described as governance. They used the terminology governance to make clear that it should not be governed by governments. Internet governance was seen as governance without government, so that the people, the affected people, the concerned uh, people, the people who are doing the job should manage this in their own way. But, you know, with the time, so many issues are now related or dependent from the management of the critical internet resources that in the WISIS we came to the conclusion, you know, we need a broader definition. And we discussed the definition and at the end of the day we came out and said, okay, the understanding of internet governance means that we have to take a broader approach, that all the issues which are discussed now in the IGF, access, openness, uh, security, stability, uh, uh, multilingualism, cyber security, security and all this are more or less part of the bigger understanding of internet governance. This makes it even more difficult, you know, for capacity building because, uh, you know, if you come into this uh, group of people who are dealing with the internet in, uh, in a certain <coughs> way, you know, it's difficult to, where to get all this knowledge that you understand the issue and then you can start, uh, you know, to do something based on this certain knowledge. And, um, uh, we uh, already in the wiki, uh, you know, we came to the conclusion that more academic work is needed. You know, we have to produce more textbooks, more teaching material, so that young people, you know, have sources where they can start to learn, you know, what it is. And part of this broader initiative was then the creation of an academic uh, network, the Global Internet uh, Governance Academic Network called GigaNet. And research and education is always is closely interlinked, so as part of the GIGANET, we developed the concept of a summer school. That means some uh, academic professors from universities around the world said, okay, you know, what is the basic knowledge for internet governance? And we developed a curricula of 48 hours, which could be included into master programs around the globe, and say, okay, if you have this knowledge, you know, um, then you have a basic understanding what internet governance is. So this uh, 48 hours program includes, you know, main uh, lectures on basic issues like law, economy, theory, history and policy. But then we have included also lectures on very practical issues. That means IP address, uh, address management, CCTLD management, GTLD management, you know, user positions. So what's the role of governments? So and we have created this block of 48 hours and have tested it out now in a the first summer school on internet governance in the year 2007. It took place in Germany and uh, this was the first group and I'm very happy to see already some of our alumni from 2007 here in the internet governance forum as participants and as panelists in various various um, uh, workshops. Um, and we have developed this concept further because it was mainly in Europe and it was the main sponsor was DENIC, the German history and we got done a lot of other supporters because we understood very well that we have to 
help the students to find a way to the summer school. So, so we developed a fellowship program so that students could apply for um, a fellowship to participate in the summer school. For the second summer school last year, or this year in July 2008, we had 168 applications for 20, 20 places. And we had fellowships for around 15 students. So, and you know, based on this um, interesting development, we decided, you know, to um, globalize this school of the, uh, the, the concept of the summer school. Because in the world, as you know, we have two summers, one summer in the north and one summer in the south. So uh, the next step was then that we will have in March next year a southern summer school on internet governance in Buenos Aires. This will take place in March. And the application forms, you know, to apply for the summer school will be distributed here during this conference. Olga Cavalli from the University of Buenos Aires is the faculty co-chair for the summer school of the South. And the 48 hours program, which I just briefly outlined here, is based on certain models. So it's rather flexible. That means the, the main global issues are um, delivered by lectures from well-known professors from, from uh, around the globe. The, uh, so we have among the faculty members Afri Doria the, from the Lulea University in Technology in Sweden. She is chair also of the GNSO. We have Bill Drake, we have Milton Müller, we have uh, John Bing, the director of the Computer Law Institute in Norway. So this is the global faculty. But for the more practical oriented issues, we uh, take professors and experts from the region. So that means if it comes to CCTLD management, it's the manager from uh, European CCTLD which will teach in the uh, European summer school. But it will be the manager from or dot, uh, .br for Brazil, which will teach CCTLD management in Latin America. If it comes to IP address management, we have RIPE in the European Summer School, but we will have LACNIC in the Southern Summer School. So, and I think the internet, as it's uh, built, you know, has all these regional institutions. And I think this is the interesting combination that we have, let's say, the global academic, uh, let's say, umbrella, and then fill it in with, you know, local experts. Uh, do the practical uh, uh, job on the ground and th this together constitutes then a good body of knowledge which is very useful if you have it pressed in one week 48 hours it's hard work so students have no time to go uh, uh, somewhere else so we have a very nice place in Germany uh, it's a very small town where are no beaches no shopping malls no discotheques so that means the students have to sit there from early in the morning to late in the evening and they have uh, discussion and have to uh, also to communicate among themselves and to learn from each other. So, and while the concept was so successful so far, we are investigating now, by the way, here in, in, in this meeting, to have a summer school for the Arab world before the next IGF. Uh, the next IGF will be in Egypt, as you know, and it would be good to have, let's say, 20, 25 people, uh, the leaders of tomorrow and the innovators, innovators of today, there and to give them you know, a, a good, good um, basic education so that they become really enabled to participate in the debate and to input, uh, to have input in, in, in further developments. And we are also discussing now um, an Asian um, uh, hub for this summer school uh, for the year 2010. Uh, Seoul or Hong Kong or um, I have discussions with Dot Asia probably to do it uh, together with the so-called um, Dot Asia summer camp in Thailand. So, and I think this is uh, one way where probably the older generation can help to enable the younger generation, you know, to get a um, good body of knowledge and to enable them that they will take the lead in the uh, next, in, in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, talking to us about this uh, way of involving more young people in the IGF. And uh, next we'll hear from Christina Irion on the topic of privacy. Hello all together, my name is Christina Irion, I'm uh, 
from Central European University in Budapest and I'm very grateful to the Blue Foundation that I'm admitted to this panel. And I'm talking about a very popular um, application amongst young people which is social network sites and certain privacy implications which uh, are related to this uh, application and uh, how this is sometimes uh, not very well uh, considered when using social network sites. So what qualifies me to talk about this issue, um, I'm still not very old, but apart from that I'm teaching information privacy class in uh, the university and I actually perceive that when we are tech uh, social network sites that many of the students uh, are not very well informed about the business aspects of social network sites. So they are basically mostly concerned with what is visible, what they see and how they share information with their peers. But what they don't see is that social network applications are actually two-sided markets, which means that there is another business model hidden behind the scenes. And this business model relies uh, heavily on the collection of personal information. And uh, this then facilitates behavioral targeting, um, advertisement and of course the uh, compilation of digital dossiers about the users which are having a huge market value. So in fact, uh, although we have uh, in some regions uh, privacy safeguards in place and also social network sites are maintaining policies on privacy, uh, the consent of the users, the terms and conditions of social network sites and also the privacy <coughs> settings we are able to uh, adjust to our needs are just one part of the solution we can see here. And social network sites do indeed potentially pose long and short term threats uh, to the privacy in particular also concerning young people which are the major target group of this uh um, applications. I mean, uh, in a way, we have to face that these are all free of charge uh, applications we are invited to use without having to incur any costs for these applications. And of course, the operator, the provider, is uh, having another way of generating revenues out of these applications. And this is the uh, other markets that we don't see where our information is then used uh, in order to. Um, to, uh, to attract businesses and marketeers to use uh, this information in order to formulate target groups and uh, actually target us with advertisement, but also to um, transfer this data to other operators that will then use this data for more purposes. So the threats uh, actually from social network sites can be distinguished in three major categories. One is the sharing itself, so that we <coughs> basically upload information about us. So it's our own responsibility to a large extent. Second one is stemming from the business model and the other one is from third parties that are actually not related uh, to the platform itself, but it, they can be our friends in the site uh, sometimes overdo uh, the um, sharing part. The first thread I would like to focus on is the thread from sharing and the question is here, do you never regret anything? In fact, uh, Facebook privacy guidelines are very, very clear about that every sharing of information is done at your own risk and that's something that is uh, immediately obvious to all of us, but at the same time uh, it happens uh, quite often that uh, information are getting uh, published that later the individual is regretting about this information being released to the public. Uh, if you want to have some very, very good uh, researched examples, then I recommend you the book of uh, Daniel Solover, The Future of Reputation, which has uh, lists uh, really many real life examples how information that were originated by the author ended up in the public sphere and there was no way to retrieve it back, although the author has probably regretted very much uh, that this information was shared. <coughs> also, it is obvious that the information that we uh, compile about us on social network sites is used by uh, third parties to find out about us. So our future employee will probably have a look at our profile before we have the interview and also our next date. So it's very important to have a certain hygiene running on social networks sites. The slogan would be think first and then post the information. More or less visible actually are the threats that are stemming from the business model. 
in fact you are not any more perfectly informed as a user what the what the uh, social network provider is knowing about you because the social network provider admits also in the terms and conditions that they are collecting all the data you are submitting that they retain the data even after you have uh, changed uh, your profile and updated it and that they will keep this uh, retained data for a reasonable period of time whatever that means because this is not specified and the reasonable period of time might uh, be interpreted differently if you are the user or the social network operator so here we also have to face that the social network operator is collecting other personal information from other sources. That is something you can also find out if you have a look in the privacy guidelines. That uh, this, this information from other sources is then combined with the information we, we uh, agree to or we hand over voluntarily in order to complete our digital dossier and get more information about our preferences and about our uh, background. The last thread is certainly stemming from third parties. So that can be other Facebook users and your friends that might overdo sometimes and uh, upload information about you, that tag you in photos and uh, share information that actually you should have been asked before about it. At the same time, of course, the other third parties that have a commercial interest in the information are advertisers and other partners of the social network operator that will have a chance to collaborate with the operator and therefore get access to information, to uh, the information that you provide automatically, like your IP address, but also they will install cookies and other automated devices on your uh, software devices on your um, on your computer in order to follow then on the long run your online behavior which makes uh, it possible to personalize advertising content but creates another digital dossier with another party something you might not be aware about in the first place and last but not least abuses uh, occur also in social network time, um, in social network sites on a more frequent basis we know that there's uh, spam that web crawlers are used in order to harvest uh, personal information that can be then later uh, put into use for identity theft and uh, if there's an interest, there's actually quite a recent report of the European Network Information Security Agency in NISA of 2007, which gives a plethora of examples on the vulnerability of social network sites. And once you have read that, uh, you might change the picture about uh, what you would like to share. So the issues that are lasting uh, is that, first of all, it's in our own hands to decide how much we want to uh, disclose about our personal lives. And uh, apart from that, we of course need to have a sharpened instinct for privacy and for the possible threats in the long term when information had been shared once in the past. So the capacity building should also cover for young people information privacy awareness raising campaigns and uh, the possibility to learn from each other and protect the privacy of our friends in social networks. Apart from that, of course, uh, a number of other implications are stemming from what I said before, from the threats on privacy. We need a clear policy on fair business practices so that uh, the information uh, that we receive as users, what is going on with our data, goes beyond what we now find in the terms and conditions of social network sites. That, of course, the data retention period, so what is not anymore on our visible profile, but what our provider still knows about us are very, very clearly defined and not in such a uh, unspecified phrase like reasonable where we don't know how long it will be kept about us. Of course, empowerment is a very important issue here. Users must be empowered to know what is happening with their personal data. So the idea would be to have something similar like an account statement that you can generate and know about what personal data of you had been processed, who received this data apart from the social network provider, and uh, what type of other information had been gathered from different sources that you were not aware about otherwise. 
And last but not least, of course, it must be possible to disable functions uh, like the transfer of personal data from the application provider uh, to third parties <coughs> in order to be sure that, you, that your data is only kept at the source where you originally consented to. So let me conclude the international Conference of Data Protection Commissioners, which was meeting in uh, September 2008. This year was uh, issuing a resolution, a joint resolution on the data protection in social networks, where they basically also identified uh, most of the issues I mentioned in this short uh, report. And here I believe uh, we have to be aware that it is great to be a digital native, but it is also important to get the full picture. And here digital natives can still do much better. Thank you very much. Thank you. As we heard, young people are redefining the concept of privacy, uh, but uh, it comes at a cost. Agnieszka Wyszeszyn from the Polish Safer Int Internet Node will uh, talk to us about a related concept, um, child safety online. Hello everyone, I, tr I feel truly honored to be able to contribute actively to this session today. Uh, as we have already heard from some of the speakers before, uh, apart from the many very obvious benefits that the internet has brought, uh, there are, it has also raised some risks, some uh, concerns about different risks uh, to children and young people for whom the virtual world has in many ways become a kind of extension of their real life. And while up to now so much focus has been given to risks such as uh, online grooming and pedophilia, there is also a challenge, uh, practically a new challenge, uh, of addressing the topic of children and young people uh, causing harm to each other with the use of internet and other new technologies, which has often led to very fatal outcomes. For instance, we have seen in Poland that children uh, have even killed each other after having been involved in a cyberbullying incident. So just a qu quick look of how we could define cyberbullying. Uh, cyberbullying is bullying, so harassing, threatening, intimidating through email, through instant messaging in a chat room, on, a web on different websites, gaming sites, or via mobile phone. It can be as simple as sending an email to someone who doesn't w simply wish to receive any communication from us, but it can go uh, along to uh, including threats, false statements, and up uploading embarrassing pictures online. Usually it is not a one-time communication, it is a repeated action. And research shows that cyberbullying instances have been on the rise over the last years. In Poland, for instance, we have been even speaking of a kind of wave of cyberbullying that has flooded uh, Polish schools. And when we look at some figures that document, uh, document this problem, uh, we see that in Poland, uh, according to the research that covered uh, young internet users aged 12 to 17, uh, the respondents reported that every second young internet user has had some contact with verbal abuse online or via mobile phone. 57% of young people report to have been at least once photographed or recorded against their will. 14 of respondents reported that their peers have published online untrue or humiliating material about them. And we may think that in many cases it is just an innocent uh, joke, but there are a number of very serious consequences of cyberbullying victimization. Uh, victims experience high levels of stress that may lead to um, consequences like running away from home, skipping school, but uh, cyberbullying consequences are all sometimes so damaging that victims commit suicide. And there have been at least a few cases in Poland uh, where cyberbullying has been linked directly uh, to the suicide of a teenager, which has also uh, provoked a very heated debate on the topic in, in, in my country. 
And when we look at the motives uh, that are behind uh, the cyberbullying acts, we see that <coughs> they are mostly motivated by anger, revenge, or frustration. Sometimes bullies do it for entertainment or simply because they are bored, and sometimes for fun, just to see what reaction they can expect. Uh, just a quick look at, on the background of where our project is operating. Uh, in Poland, the population is almost 40 million people, out of which children under 15 are 6 million. And uh, the broadband penetration is uh, some 80% of uh, school aged children using internet, and uh, the mobile phones 70% of children aged 7 to 14, and in the age group 12, 17, it's over 90% of young people having a mobile phone. And seeing uh, that cyberbullying really hurts and that children really suffer uh, from such cases, we, and they are also reluctant in telling a trusted adult about what they are going through, we have launched a special internet safety helpline where children can seek help in, in such cases. Uh, the mission of our helpline is exactly to help to assist children and young people who face risks online when using the internet and mobile phones. When they are bullied, threatened or blackmailed online, when they receive crude text messages, when someone on a chat or a communicator asks them embarrassing questions, demands their photos, on insists or on a face-to-face -face meeting, but also when they receive or are, are shown inappropriate content such as pornography or violence and feel very disturbed about it. There are three ways in which uh, children and young people can uh, reach our consultants. It is a free toll, a toll-free number, but also via email and chat available on the website. And uh, we, our helpline has uh, been running for almost two years now, and we have seen that approximately 30% of reports coming to helpline concern cyberbullying cases that can have different forms, such as sending obscene text messages from the internet, intimidating children via instant messaging system or chats, ridiculing the child through creating a fake profile or blogs which contain untrue or humiliating information. There may be a question, how can we compare cyberbullying to traditional forms of bullying? Although uh, cyberbullying and bullying share some certain features, they are, they are distinct uh, phenomena. Bullying has always been present uh, at schools, but technology definitely makes uh, bullying much easier than it was before with email and uh, chats that can reach immediately thousands of people. There was a time when all bullying happened face to face, but now cyberbullying, uh, cyber bullies can threaten their victims anonymously, which obviously also increases the level on, of anxiety in the victims. Uh, also, traditionally, in traditional bullying, the bullier had to be strong to be able to face the victim in person, right? So now this tra these roles have changed slightly, because online the bullier can be very weak and do things that normally wouldn't be able to do in person. Cyberbullying is also easier to do than traditional bullying because all, is, uh, all it takes to reach the keyboard and the uh, cyber bullier can humiliate the victim. It's also hard to stop. It can easily reach the audience of millions in a very short time. And once something is put online, you practically lose control over it. With traditional bullying, the target could be safe at home, but with cyberbullying, there is no escape, there is no safe place. The victim can be reached practically 24 hours, seven days a week, with internet that the child is using to do, for instance, homework or some research work, or via a mobile phone that is practically constantly on. And looking uh, and all those character characteristics, we uh, have realized in Poland that this problem has to be tackled at various levels, has to involve not only children and young people themselves, but also parents and professionals that work directly with children. A, a year ago, we launched a campaign, a nationwide campaign, under the slogan Stop Cyberbullying. Which, is, which practically has covered most of the schools in Poland. And just as a quick example, I would like to show you a video that we have developed within this campaign. 
Każdego dnia wiele młodych osób pada ofiarą cyberprzemocy. Na pozór niewinny żart z użyciem telefonu komórkowego lub internetu może doprowadzić do prawdziwego dramatu. Zrobili mi komórkę film na wf -ie. jak się przebierałam. Wysłali go po całej klasie. Potem ktoś rzucił go do internetu. Od razu zaczęłam dostawać głupie i wulgarne SMS-y. Głupio mi nawet powtarzać. Ja mam wrażenie, że cała szkoła się ze mnie śmieje. Ej, weź mi stąd, co? No proszę cię, nie rozumiesz? Urządzenia multimedialne mają wiele dobrych zastosowań, ale niewłaściwie używane mogą stać się niebezpiecznym narzędziem. Bardzo się wstydziłam. Byłam załamana. Nie chciałam pogadywać się w szkole. Przestałam wychodzić z domu. Myślałam o najgorszym. Czy w Twojej szkole dochodzi do podobnych sytuacji? Byłeś świadkiem lub ofiarą cyberprzemocy? To miało być tylko żart, no. Ja i moi koledzy nie wiedzieliśmy, że tak bardzo ją skrzywdzimy. Teraz każdy w szkole ma telefon z aparatę, z kamerą, kręci filmy, zrobi zdjęcia. Teraz my mamy problem. Chciałbym to jakoś odkręcić. Wiedziałam, że chłopak nagrali ten film, ale nikt nie przypuszczał, że tak się potoczy. Myślałam, że to nic takiego, po prostu żart. Dopiero jak Dominika przestała przychodzić do szkoły i zobaczyłem w necie komentarze na jej temat, zrozumiałem, jaką krzywdę je wyrządzono. Jesteś ofiarą lub świadkiem cyberprzemocy? Nie bój się działać. Poproś o pomoc zaufaną osobę dorosłą lub skontaktuj się z helpline.org.pl albo zadzwoń 0800 100 100. Pamiętaj, nie jesteś sam. Okay, so as I said, this video has been distributed in almost all schools across the country and it is accompanied by a special lesson plans that we have developed to assist teachers that are wishing to, to run such classes in, at, in schools. And uh, during such a lesson, uh, children are divided into four groups and uh, have to discuss one of the aspects of the cyberbullying incident shown in the video. And they have, elaborate, they have to elaborate some solutions like think of how would a victim feel, what should a bystander do, what reaction should parents take and so on. So it helps, really helps to sensitize them and show them that those are not jokes, that it can really ruin life. Okay, I hope, hopefully it was kind of inspiration for you just to show you that cyberbullying is bullying and these are not, that children and young people in such cases do require adults support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sure you will have many questions from the audience. Um, on a slightly more positive note, uh, let's hear our last speaker. He will talk about a project called Life Units, and then uh, we'll turn it over to you for some questions. And thank you so much for staying um, a little bit uh, longer than we had planned. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to talk about a project. Um, this is a project in the initial stage and we have named it Life Units. Uh, this is aimed at uh, increasing the number of blood donations in India. Uh, I'll try to give a brief snapshot of the entire project and uh, let me start with the problem that exists in India right now. Uh, as you can see from the, my presentation, half of the maternal deaths are due to shortage of blood in India. Uh, and there's an increasing number of crude deaths every year and India requires around 8 million units of uh, units every year and uh, the, inc uh, the demand is ever increasing with the increasing number of uh, terrorist attacks and other things and there's a collection of only 5.5 million units of blood that is through voluntary blood donation. Uh, what we plan to do is to uh, have an integration, having a uh, national 
network of all the stakeholders in this particular cause. That is, uh, we want to integrate the blood banks, the hospitals, the people who want to donate blood, and the people who actually require blood. So um, we have come up with a portal that is uh, lifeunits.com, and it starts, um, a person can register himself as a voluntary donor, and he can even volunteer himself for this cause in order to motivate other people to donate blood. And uh, with the integration with the blood banks and the hospitals, a person can uh, fix appointments with these hospitals and blood banks and go and donate blood. Normally, if you, if, if you are aware of the scenario in India, a person who donates blood uh, wait for an emergency calls, uh, call or he waits for a blood donation camp happening in his vicinity. And there is uh, no proper integration between the uh, various stakeholders. So through the portal, through the entire system, uh, he'll be able to fix appointments and even the hospitals can raise uh, because they're the people who actually know what is the actual need of blood so they are the people who will be uh, updating their daily uh, needs and as well as uh, they can update their daily stocks of the amount of blood that they have with them uh, the problem is uh, normal people do not know what is the actual requirement of blood and everyone feels there's enough blood but uh, why, until and unless this the actual information comes out in real time no one knows what is the actual scenario uh, plus we we plan to uh, have leading doctors on our panel through which uh, people can, there are a lot of myths related to blood donation, people feel scary, it's not safe. So they can be, there will be a set of doctors uh, in the network who will assist people, will clear their doubts with the help of emails as well as through telephones. So now a person who is in need of blood can raise a need on the website. So that need is there on the website. Then an automated email and an SMS goes to people who are already uh, there on the network. And then they can get back uh, to the person who requires blood and donate blood. Another thing is there is, uh, apart from a social cause, uh, there is no motivation as such uh, for a person to go and donate blood unless and until someone near or dear one of him or her requires blood. So what we plan to do is to use some concepts of Web 2.0 that is a part of social networking where people can form uh, some communities, uh, some groups on the portal. Like suppose uh, we can have a group of people staying in this particular area in Hyderabad, people working in a particular company and there is a sort of a competition on which group donates the maximum number of uh, units of blood. Uh, Plus, uh, a people, people will be encouraged by giving them various points. That is, uh, you register on the website, you'll get some points, you donate blood, you invite your friends to be part of the network, uh, various other things. You share some stories of uh, real blood donation requirements, or uh, you go and donate blood, you motivate people. So everything you do and in whatever way possible, uh, you contribute uh, to the entire system, you get some points, and then uh, we can have a, a person like a volunteer of the month or volunteer of a year or something like that and uh, he can be motivated by giving in some gifts or uh, by highlighting his achievements on the home page of the website. So this is the entire network that we plan to do. Uh, plus uh, we plan to set up blogs and forums where people can share their information, uh, their stories which can help in motivating people to come and come forward and donate blood. Uh, apart from addressing to the emergency situations, uh, we'll be maintaining an uh, entire uh, database of a per, uh, when a person has actually donated blood. So that next time when he's eligible to donate blood, that is after three months or six months, he can, he'll be reminded and he can come forward and donate blood. So that is how uh, a system can be evolved where uh, people start donating blood on a regular basis and the entire problem can be solved and there's no, no more panic situation. Uh, uh, when some emergency arrives. Uh, statistics will be another feature through which, uh, again, uh, how many people are registered, how many people are donating on what basis, and what is the actual requirement. 
uh, privacy is uh, one of the major concerns and a part of these kind of initiatives are already running all over. But the main thing is um, we, we are not disclosing any uh, personal information of the person who is already registered. So the thing is uh, we might have a centralized helpline where tomorrow if I require blood I call up that helpline and then that person gets in touch with whoever is there on the network and go forward and uh, donate blood. So the entire system is like uh, to have like uh, in India, the, the, uh, India is an IT boom. There are around uh, 2 million people who are uh, working uh, in the IT companies. And if you see the requirement, the shortages are only 2.5 million units. So even if you are able to mobilize even half of this population, because we are sure that these people are using the internet and are aware of the latest things that are coming up in internet and information and communication technology. So even if you are able to mobilize this, even half of the two million people who are currently only in the IT companies plus the other people who are already on the internet to become part of this system. So according to us, uh, this problem can be solved in, in, in the near future. Um, uh, another thing is, um, this project is uh, primarily uh, led by the youth, uh, like we have a group of 4-5 uh, students, we are doing MBA, and uh, through this uh, we, we plan to involve uh, students, primarily youth from all over India who can take care of the requirements and coordination of the entire activity in their particular locality. So that, because in, that's the basic advantage of the internet, so that we can mobilize people here and there and get more and more people involved in this. So that is a brief snapshot that I wanted to give about this project and I would like to hear some feedbacks from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi, for uh, sharing with us this example of a youth-led project that uh, uses internet technology for such a fantastic cause. Um, before I turn it over to the audience, I would just like to uh, give Marilia the opportunity to address a question from our audience following this session online. And the question uh, was, where are the remote hubs located? So if we could have a microphone here in the front row. For Marilia, that would be great. I'm sorry, I didn't mention it in my presentation, and people are just hearing, so they didn't see where the hubs are located. So they are in Buenos Aires, Argentina, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Belgrade, Serbia, Madrid, Spain, Barcelona, Spain, Lahore, Pakistan, and Poon, India. Great. Thank you. And I see we have a first question uh, in the f fifth row. On the left? No, on the left, I'm, oh, it was just, great, thank you. <laughs> we'll go there next. Hi, I'm Sun Yong Yang, ISOC ambassador for ISEP this year, and I'm from South Korea. South Korea is the country more than 70% of which population uses the internet. In the case of teenagers and 20s, the internet using population is more than 90%, similar to Poland. From my perspectives and experiences, I do not think UC is minority in internet governance, but actually leading group. They are involved in internet governance in their everyday life by building up new internet cultures and trends in various internet communities. These composing internet cultures led by youth play an important role in determining internet structures because the internet is based on user-created contents. In this sense, it is a long-led approach to consider youth as a minority in internet governance. We should be careful not to be confused between internet governance and internet governance forum. These two are not the same. For sure, internet governance forum seems to feel lack of use as stakeholders, but for internet governance in general, youth are one of the most active groups to evolve internet governance. So, considering youth, I think our main question should be changed, like 
how can we attract this powerful and huge number of stakeholders into IGF to make discussions in IGF more powerful and meaningful? Because the youth may not be interested in the conference like IGF, which is not as fun as their world, such as YouTube, Facebook, and MySpace. Thank you. Great question. Um, Ravi, would you mind commenting on that as a young person who is here with us? Um. I think uh, uh, today's youth, uh, I can talk about the Indian perspective. There are a lot of opportunities uh, where youth can play an important role, especially in the development phase, uh, working on projects related to ICD for development. And by involving youth in these kind of forums, the youth uh, gets an opportunity to understand uh, what various projects are going on, plus they get an opportunity to network with people and take, their, take forward their projects. So that is where I feel uh, youth should be part of of uh, these kind of uh, forums and should play a major role in this. Thank you. And I think there was a question right behind the person who just spoke. Hi. Um, my name is Anju and like Sang Yong, I also uh, am one of the ISOC ambassadors and I represent the Pacific community. Um, as you're probably aware, the, the Pacific community right now, the, the rural and remote areas, there's a lot of connectivity issues. And um, my, my there are some sexual predators that go to the rural and remote areas and, and because of illiter illiteracy in most parts, um, children are vulnerable and um, they basically they are not aware of the issues and uh, they are sexually uh, exploited like um, videos, are t uh, videos are taken and uh, photos are taken. So my, my, my question is, I mean, there's a lot of awareness I know in the pub, uh, in the urban centres, but how can we make sure that there's a lot of awareness with the in the rural communities? I mean, we have hubs, but um, right now um, we do have telecentres, sorry, but there's no like hub or anything that um, uh, trains young people to actually um, to to allow that uh, there's a lot of awareness for other children. So, Agnieszka, would you like to take that one? Maybe I could give an example of Poland, which is quite a large country. So it, at the very beginning, when we were starting our internet safety activities in 2005, it was quite a challenge for us how to cover the whole country and be effective in what we are doing. So what we, what we decided to do is, uh, okay, maybe I will explain a bit of the background. My organization is part of so-called Polish Safer Internet Node, established within uh, European Commission's Safer Internet Program, and acts as a kind of coordinating organization for uh, awareness raising initiatives in Poland. But what was very important for us was not was to show people across the country that not uh, that actually our success depends to a high degree on their involvement. So we rely very much on uh, a, like a network of local organizations. It, those can be NGOs, psych psychological support centers, libraries, different organizations that also work with volunteers. And we, at the beginning of our activities, we did a kind of tour across the country and uh, did some trainings <laughs> with them and are, have a kind of local, well, national, sorry, coalition of internet safety ambassadors that we try constantly to keep in touch with and, uh, well, train them and send our awareness materials so that we know that they are doing a good work at the local level and they can count on us every, every time they need to. So this is kind of train the trainers model that goes beyond Warsaw where we are operating. Let's go to the second row on the right. Um, right, right there. And then we'll come to the front row and then the back to the second row. Or the, yeah. sorry, third. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Chief Ankama. I am a member of parliament from Namibia. And we make laws. Um, internet connectivity communication is a very powerful tool. And when you allow, or when you give chances to people like young people to communicate with each other, definitely it will reach uh, to greater heights. Uh, it then depends on how the degree of use and the protection of personal data. And this is my concern. My concern, or rather my question, is regulations. 
how do we regulate that person data is kept safe and that indeed uh, this powerful tool of communication is also not being abused. I thank you. Christina, is that something you would like to address? I would take this question. Thank you. Um, Regulation is, of course, uh, one of the possible solutions uh, in this field, but regulation is only as good as enforcement and implementation of this regulation is. There are a number of uh, problems that are imminent to the Internet which make regulation somewhat a, let's say, um, insufficient tool if it is not done on a more international basis. Because the moment uh, personal data entered by the users crossing borders, you are outside of the jurisdiction of a country and as good as your regulation is, might not be with the country where the data is arriving. So here there is clearly uh, a certain need for an international collaboration in whatever sense. And uh, there are a number of uh, solutions, of course there are uh, regional agreements we are aware of, uh, like the uh, Convention on Personal Data Protection of the Council of Europe, or also another framework in Asia by the APEC data protection framework of the uh, Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation. So these are the types of instruments perhaps also in Africa could be considered. Uh, but instead of uh, doing something which is maybe not um, coherent with the existing frameworks, it also is possible of course to simply um, join and associate with existing uh, Agreements. So, for instance, the Council of Europe instrument, which is very successful actually, uh, is open for countries that are not members. So they can basically simply enter into this agreement and by implementing it into their national uh, regulatory frameworks, they would set up a possible solution. However, as I said, it needs to be enforced and here collaboration between enforcement agencies is very important. Thank you. Great. And there was a question in the front row, I believe. Good afternoon, I'm uh, Praveen Kumar. I'm a police officer uh, of India. Uh, unfortunately, our experience with uh, social networking sites has been uh, a very, uh, you know, negative. Uh, wherein uh, we came across uh, many youth, uh, you know, reporting to us saying that uh, their personal data has been pasted in uh, scraps or some other forums of the networking sites like Arkut, MyFace and then tag.com and many n number of sites where uh, they paste the mobile number or some other contact number uh, whether it is a terrestrial line or uh, we call it as landline here or mobile number and then paste it and then write some message that yeah for any sexual enjoyment uh, you just contact this number. This number could be of any uh, guy or girl. After the moment that is pasted in the net, the next thing that to happen is to the, the guy whose number is pasted there gets hundreds and thousands of calls every day. That becomes a, a virtual harassment. Mm -hmm. So when that the victim comes to us and then uh, asks, uh, asks, requests us to investigate the case, uh, first take the complaint and the, register the case and then investigate later, the problem with the investigators has been, uh, you know, to know the IP address of the guy from where, uh, from where the information has been uh, uploaded. The, in that, uh, we are really facing problems. Uh, one is uh, in, uh, internet service providers, of course, uh, they will do. But beyond that, the companies, Akut, uh, Facebook, the agencies which are operating these, uh, uh, you know, networking sites, the uh, response from those sites has been very, very, uh, you know, unfortunately slow. So I think there is every need for this uh, forum uh, to address to those uh, operators who are maintaining all these sites to respond to the law enforcement agencies to, you know, uh, give the information as fast as possible. This is one area I think uh, we need to, you know, uh, concentrate more, number one. Great. The second one, uh, the last one, the second one is that uh, our experience again has been that it is very important to prevent this kind of crime then because as you rightly pointed out that once you post the information that is forever in the net. So that is, uh, you know, uh, liable to be used by anyone in any way. So what I personally feel is prevention is always better than investigation of this offense. So how do we prevent? Uh, again, as you rightly said, 
it has to be a part of the school curriculum or college curriculum or lesson plan or any uh, what we have done in hyderabad for example i am working in hyderabad what we have done is we have launched a website hyderabadpolice.gov.in in that we have exclusively given a exclusive link on uh, you know safety on internet uh, safety in social networking and safety during spam and all the uh, safety tips we have given i'm just sharing the experience with you thank you great thank you very much i uh, will take three more questions and i think i've already uh, seen some people who have been uh, putting their hand up for quite a while so let's go to the third row in the front and then to katitza and then back to um, the second half of their right hand side so you have a mic go ahead Okay, thank you. My name is Jyrki Kasvi and I'm, I'm an MP from the Finnish Parliament. And first I'd like to give you one of the reasons why we are having these problems. Because there was a recent Eurobarometer study in Europe, in several European countries, and they found out that there are two people, children and teenagers, never go to when they have problems in the web, even serious problems. It is their parents, because their parents' reaction are so they think that uh, they are so illogical. Because usually when you have, for example, a predator in the web, uh, the parents say to their children, you won't go to web anymore. It is seen as a punishment. So your parents punish their children when their children are victims. So children don't go to their parents. And that's why many of these problems can grow and grow and grow. And when you go to these uh, social applications, it's also adults ca that can do terrible things with this information. We had a case in Finland where, uh, where some teenager girls had posted some uh, videos of themselves when they were... I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm wondering if you could pose a question, because we're quickly running out of time. And All right, then I'll uh, focus on the question. It's this, you're, how do you propose that we can educate actually our parents, not authorities, not the children, but the parents? to do, do a better job. Who would like to take that? Try. Yeah, I definitely agree that the same happens in Poland. What we have noticed that parents would have the tendency of when something bad has happened to their child online, they would rather cut them off from the internet to keep them safe. And this, this group of parents is really a challenge to, to address and to target. So well, since 2005 we have been working with parents a lot, mainly through schools, uh, through teachers that are holding like special workshops, special meetings with parents, uh, educating them on the issue. And uh, we're trying to encourage them to speak to their children and actually not because parents in Poland and probably in, uh, everywhere are ashamed of the fact that they know so little about technologies. They are lagging behind and they are somehow out of control. So to, what we are trying to show parents is that it's not, a, it's not a shame, it's not embarrassing, that they should actually let their kids be an expert and this way try to learn from the children themselves, not to, like it's a kind of changing roles. And also not to magnify the risks because of course it is important to keep a healthy balance. Okay, the risks are there online, but probably most, I mean vast majority of children that go online would never experience, have any bad experience online. And we should also remember the whole range of benefits that, that that children have there. Uh, but also uh, it is important to show parents that um, they have to be there when the child experiences something bad online and they, they shouldn't blame their children. So that, for instance, especially in cases where a child uh, encounters uh, pornography or some, some content that would maybe embarrassing, children would rarely go and report it to